The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, what's going on? How you doing, Bart? buddy? Good. We just got the solar eclipse here. Just um, the moon just started crossing over the sun. Oh wow! Yeah, Did I got the glasses us? and everything. No, really? How was it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we talked about kind of this head and shoulders pattern for a while uh, on the stock market that had developed, and I think it's still in play. So uh, shoulder, head, shoulder, um, and then neckline, and then the breakdown there has basically come up to retest that. Um, Effectively, this pump in my mind was the war pig trade. So, um, you know, the more war broke out and Congress had bought defense stocks and everyone's like, oh, you know, more war means more bombs and more defense stocks. So I think that was a big, likely a big driver of the stock market um, because people are now it used to be like, oh, there would be war and then everyone would be uncertain. And uncertainty is like it's like the kryptonite of markets. But now. Everyone's like, oh, well, if there's war, then that just means they're going to print more money, which means the stocks are going to go up, especially defense stocks. So um, I think that's kind of what happened here with this pump. Um, so uh, honestly, I'm I'm still not convinced that that things are going to come back here to back to the all time highs. Um, I'm still basically on my my general thesis of overall down ish until the end of year. Um, we don't we don't see any like major signals uh, as of late that tell us that things are about to crash. Um, like, so for example, the, um, the yield curve inversion on the bottom and then all of the individual yield yields up top, like there's nothing there that would suggest that, um, that we're going to crash anytime soon. Um, let's see, I've drawn a couple new lines on this chart. This is the NASDAQ. So you can see that we've kind of got this line right here. Um, this is starting to look slightly like a bullish flag, right? So a bullish flag is when you go up and then you kind of consolidate and you go down and eventually you pump to the upside. Um, so I think that, that that could very much be in play with the strength that the stock market has shown for the past, let's just say five months, six months. Um, you know, I was, I was kind of thinking that we might actually end up down here in this range uh, on the NASDAQ, but I, I think it could actually be very possible that we just kind of do this and then that stocks um, go to the upside. Um, somewhere in December or maybe early 2024. That would kind of be what this this pattern is starting to suggest. Um, it's it's quite possible that we could meet the downside target, um, which would be it would be somewhere around here. Like that that's possible. But right now this channel is so strong. Um, this this big channel right here is so strong that I would expect. Um, really, that's kind of like where you would target for stocks to remain. Um, now, if they want to be irresponsible and create inflation, well, then they'll just push stocks and they'll they'll push it up like that. Um, so, you know, who, who knows what they're going to do? It seems like they love their inflation. Um, let's see. Gold gave us a big green dildo yesterday. Uh, thing just pumped uh, to the upside. And when we say big green dildo for gold, you know, three percent is, is, is a pretty significant move. So um, basically, it, gold found support where we were talking about last week, right around here. Said, "Hey, this might be if you were trying to get into a gold position. This is you would buy maybe twenty or thirty percent of your allocation right here, um, being responsible. Um, that's really like if you're because again, you're you should be reallocating positions occasionally. You really shouldn't be trading. Um, and I know that uh, I know that a lot of people." Um, in Monero, especially in Monero, aren't traders at all, and they really like just don't care about um, what the price is doing, and that's great. Um, I also would say that what we're doing is inherently monetary, and so you ignore the monetary landscape at your own peril. Um, like if you're a hodler and you're a DCA, like that's fine. You believe in the project fundamentals, you know that's totally fine. I totally understand that. Um, yet at the same time, I feel like looking at what's happening in the markets helps you to understand what's happening in the world um, in certain kinds of ways. It, for example. Note, um, noting the fact that uh, two weeks ago, noting the fact that Congress was loading up on defense stocks, right? That's like that's a signal that you can use for both trading, but it's also a signal to understand what's what's happening in the world. Um, so, anyways, um, yeah, gold gold is performing um, pretty good right here. Um, I'm still not totally convinced that this thing is ready to break out now, um, but maybe, right? The the way that they treat gold, like in in a fundamental sense the way they treat gold i wouldn't be surprised you know again to watch this thing come back down to this lower line but maybe it doesn't um the fact that it got such a strong bounce off of that support you know that that um that could be an indication that gold is really is really wanting to take off here soon 
Um, again, it's a long-term play. It's a value storage kind of thing with the potential that it could get revaluated um, much higher at some point in the in the short to medium term, maybe to the long term, right? Hopefully within the next, I would say the next year or so. Um, that would be kind of my guess. Um, let's take a look at the global liquidity situation. Uh, the U.S. liquidity is in green, global liquidity is in white. Um, not much has changed with global liquidity. It's uh, kind of going down. One thing that I noticed here is that you'll notice that U.S. liquidity, so again, we're talking about um, the Federal Reserve balance sheet. We're talking about M2 money supply and the reverse repos. Um, the reverse repo is kind of acting inversely, where as money goes into the reverse repos, that's liquidity coming out of the system. And as money um, leaves reverse repos, that's that's liquidity going somewhere. So this chart down here, you'll see that um, reverse repo continues to drop. It's now down to a trillion. It used to be up above two trillion. Um, so what I'm seeing here is like a bit of divergence on the action. So in green, the, the US liquidity situation is kind of making higher highs, but it's divergent from the action on stocks, right? Stocks are making lower highs right now. So sometimes we talk about um, RSI. I, I look at Z-scores, but it's it's a very similar kind of chart. Um, right now, I wonder if something like this isn't in play right here where liquidity is is making higher highs. Like there's more liquidity, but they can't quite get stocks to, to perform, right? They can't quite get them to higher highs. So I do wonder if that's a signal, um, uh, again, of a potential downside. So. Uh, just uh, kind of a note, you know, to, to keep in your mind there. Dollar index. Um, we talked about last week. I said I would be surprised if if the dollar just you know cratered below this area right here because we've got um, we've got the the rising resistance line and we've got this kind of horizontal area of significance, which was that spot right there. Um, so yeah, the dollar has kind of uh, made a little bit of a rebound here, bounced back up. It's kind of above this trend line. Um, this trend line right here is a good example of why trend lines are bullshit. <laughs> you know, you got to be careful with them. Um, and and fake outs happen all the time. So they're in a lot of ways, they're visual references. Um, and then you look for confluence of visual references, uh, which is kind of something we did down here. And um, like earlier this, uh, maybe a few months ago, right, when the dollar was kind of like testing this area right here. Um, that was a time that a line that some pleb lines actually did make sense. And it, and it was like, they were important and significant, and then you know we could, we saw the continuation of that run. So um, I think that dollar the dollar index is probably, I mean, it, it could continue going up, but I wouldn't expect like a massive move up in the dollar right here. Um, it should be finding significant resistance um, somewhere with like basically where we are right now, 106, 108, 109. I'd be surprised if if it got all the way to 110. Um, let's see, I just turned on the wave magic, so. Again, you can see the upper standard deviation bands here. Um, these are slightly longer term, so this is going to be limiting, um, right? These blue bands here, along with the um, these very, very long term uh, pleb lines, uh, trend lines from. If we go to like the monthly, you'll see why these lines are drawn this way. Oh, it takes a while. Let me clear the wave magic. There we go. Yeah, so these lines are drawn that way. You can see it's like basically just a big channel that's been happening for 15 years now. Um, so at the moment, um, you know, I, if you're a, if you're a Forex trader, this thing is going to probably not do anything crazy to the upside. Um, but it could at some point later, um, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect this thing to get back up here, but, but maybe like that's, that's a little bit too far to, to say with any certainty. Um, let's see, we looked at that, we looked at stocks, maybe we could take a look at the ratio. Yeah. So, uh, the NASDAQ to S and P ratio still looks it still looks bullish. This thing right here, this chart right here, the NASDAQ to S&P ratio is an indication that maybe stocks are not going to, to take any big dip. Maybe the direction is to kind of meander on down in a, in a bullish flag scenario where it's like, okay, you're making lower lows and you're making lower highs, but that bull flag is going to break to the upside eventually. Um, that would like, so that hypothetical scenario would be corroborated by this chart right here. Um, cause this looks bullish. Like you've got these upsloping blue bands. You're now starting to ride above these very long-term upper standard deviations, and they're already starting to curl to the upside. So if this thing kind of rides those bands and then starts moving up. Um, you know, it, it might be, it might be close to time to start abandoning my, um, my down until the end of your thesis. So, um, it's always important to always, um, question your thesis when you're a trader, like you can't let ego get in the way. You can't get stuck into a trade. You've just always got to be looking for the counter reason, um, why you could be wrong. And, um, that's not to say that you should like allow yourself to get captured by analysis paralysis, but, um, but you definitely need to, um, to always be considering the counter position. And that's probably true. Like in general, um, in life, 
Uh, and that is, that's actually something that learning markets has taught me is to like, be okay with it, with abandoning a position and being like, no, I was wrong, you know, um, and, and to not like feel, you know, not let your ego get in the way of being able to do that. Um, it, it does help you to see things more clearly and it does help you to like, um, adapt, you know, to the real world as things change. Okay. So now we're looking at the inflation, um, the, <laughs> the alleged inflation rates, um, the CPI is in white. The core inflation is in orange and the core inflation is the one that we care the most about for, for the most part. Um, CPI, we got these numbers um, last week, uh, was flat and then core continues to drop. Like this is, this is a good thing. This is definitely a good sign for the economy. Um, you can see that this line right here, this horizontal area of significance, right around 4% inflation. The last time that we were there was like the early nineties, the late eighties. Um, and then for like most of for basically for all of the 90s and the aughts and like for the last 30 years almost um it's the core inflation has been around two percent around that target that the fed has uh, allegedly targets um so we're getting close there um this is good that it keeps coming down if you're you know if you want those gains if you want the markets to go up getting core inflation lower is good it means that they can do the intervention that will cause our bags to pump <laughs> i know that's um I feel dirty saying that, so I apologize uh, for being philosophically inconsistent right there. Uh, okay, let's go to Monero. Let's let's talk about Monero because <laughs> yeah, you're, changing. You're addicted, man. You're addicted to that fiat. Give, give me more. Right. Print it. Can't wait to dump all my crypto for more of my dirty fiat. Buy some champagne, maybe a casa in the hills. There you go. Changing topics quickly and ashamedly. <laughs> <laughs> we've got uh, Monero Bitcoin. So we finally, we finally broke to the upside um, on this sort of like down sloping line here. Uh, this is good. Like we like this, but um, at the same time, like we're still horizontally challenged over here. Um, we're not, uh, we're not actually breaking through um, these, these horizontal lines here. Now um, maybe probably that could happen, right? This, I mean, to me uh, in a longer term, this is a bullish chart at a minimum. It's at least um, a neutral chart, right? Uh, Monero is holding its price against Bitcoin on very long time frames. We're slightly below, um, let's see. So like right here, you know, kind of the launch price uh, bear market last time, like we're slightly below that area right there. Okay, no, no big deal. Um, I would, you know, I mean, Monero is fundamentally used. So I, I think there's a good chance that it continues doing well against Bitcoin. Um, I think Bitcoin is getting a little bit of a bump right now from BitVM where they can... Uh, so someone released a paper where they can they found a way that you, they can do Turing completeness for the most part on Bitcoin. It's a bit convoluted. They've got a lot of extra steps. You know that that, that just sounds like a virtual machine with extra steps. Um, that they've got like some a lot of research to do still. They've got a lot of implementation to do, um, and it's an optimistic system. All right. So pro uh, in fact, maybe we should just like address this completely here. So um, someone released a paper where you don't have to actually um, do a soft fork or add a new opcode to Bitcoin to be able to do Turing completeness. Um, it's it's it sounds a lot like a roll up to me um, in kind of like the way that that it could be implemented. the The important thing is that it's an optimistic system, and when we say optimistic, it means that you trust you basically trust that the person posting the the hash or the proof on chain has told the truth. And if they haven't told the truth, then you have the opportunity to challenge that. Um, if there's enough block space, you know, within the within the time lock period, um, that could be challenged, right? So Lightning Network is an optimistic system. There are rollups on Ethereum that are called optimistic rollups, specifically because you just basically trust optimistically that the person posting the proofs is telling the truth. And if they're not, someone will come along and be like, you, you hope optimistically that someone will come along and be like, hey, by the way, that was a bad proof. Um, here's the real proof, uh, and then um, you know you make some kind of adjustment to people's balances or something like that. Um, this is this is in contradistinction to where you can't actually get a transaction on chain unless like it's proven cryptographically, um, which is uh, they call those validity rollups or zk rollups um, or zk snark rollup constructions. You can't actually post the transaction unless it's like legitimately true. It's like it's like a regular crypto transaction, right? You can't like you don't optimistically post a, a crypto transaction, uh, a regular on chain transaction and be like, well, someone proved me wrong. It's like you couldn't do it unless the cryptographic proof was correct. Um, so anyways, this bit VM thing, it's they can they can do Turing completeness. They can do things like oracles. It's really a big question mark on how well they can do it. Um, there's also CTV, which seems to be um, pretty powerful. Um, I, I was looking into it this past week. And it seems very, very powerful. Um, 
maybe that combined with uh, BitVM can give Bitcoin some scaling options. I'm still not convinced that anything is going to happen soon. Um, but nonetheless, I think Bitcoin got a big bump here. Um, maybe not a big bump, but a little bump um, from kind of these news, right? These like CTV is coming, maybe probably, and then BitVM. And so they're all like all the maxis that said how terrible um, all of these contracts were and how dangerous everything was are now celebrating that uh, that they can also do the same thing in a very convoluted, more difficult kind of way. Another thing to think about um, turning completeness on Bitcoin in this way think about all the ethereum contracts that have just crashed and burned like even contracts and projects that were trying to be honest that were maybe quote unquote good projects um, but they had like some critical failures some like small thing that they overlooked and this is on a chain that's specifically designed with a with a coding platform to do turing completeness like that it was designed from the ground up on layer one to do turing completeness and they had these mass you know that you've had massive failures over the years and that's just kind of like it's kind of like um the price of engineering right you, you build something it it, it <laughs> it crashes, it gets destroyed, whatever. And then you try to build back better. Um, so I think to myself, okay, BitVM is a more convoluted way of trying to do these turn complete smart contracts. Um, and you're sort of like optimistically pegging back to chain. You're not even like verifying in a hardcore way like Ethereum does on layer one. How many catastrophic failures are they going to have in, in the attempt at trying to get smart contracts like this on Bitcoin? Um, I wonder that. Uh, so anyways, that's kind of like my general feel on what's happening there. There's a lot of promise. It's kind of like Lightning Network six years ago. There's a lot of promise. It'll probably work. It'll probably like things will be developed there, but how much will it really be practical? How much will it really be adopted? It, it's hard to say. I, my guess is it's going to be, you know, another five or six years. It'll be 2030 and they'll be like, yeah, yeah, BitVM is, you know, it's right around the corner, hashtag 18 months. Um, but, you know, that's my speculation. We don't really know. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. Um, so right here, this is the Bitcoin dominance chart. You know, it's kind of taken a, a little bounce here. Not, not a huge bounce, but um, when we talk about like 3% move on the Bitcoin dominance chart, that's actually a pretty big move. Like in, in terms of market cap, that is a pretty big move. Um, and you can see it here with... That was from the Bitcoin VM? I think it's kind of the combination of the excitement starting to happen in Bitcoin with CTV um, drive chains, even though no one wants drive chains, it's a possibility. And then BitVM. Yeah. It's like people saying, Oh, look, we can do this stuff. We can scale. Here's the promise. Cause we were starting to, in my, in my mind, like from my, um, anecdotal experience on the Twitters, it did look to me like, um, Bitcoiners were starting to realize that lightning network kind of did have these significant challenges and it's not moving as fast as they thought it would. And it's not being adopted like they thought it would. And everyone is using it custodially, custodially apart from Phoenix, where you just like totally pwn your privacy. So I, I do think like intuitively that a lot of Bitcoiners and maximalists are, were kind of like, yeah, you know, we need, we need something else. I think that it's likely that that bump recently in the Bitcoin dominance could have been related to that. Um, I mean, you know, that's sort of speculative, right? I'm like, it's like when you watch the news and they're like, stocks are up today on the news of a government bailout for, I don't know, for the airliners or something like that. Like they, yeah, or they just, they insert the latest news as the reason for the stocks going up and there could be like a false correlation fallacy there. Um, but I mean, there is like a, a significant resurgence of optimism, I think that I've seen on Bitcoin. Um, so, okay. uh, I, you know, we'll see like this, this chart does look slightly bullish. Like I'm not going to lie. The Bitcoin dominance chart looks pretty good right here. Um, that, that could also just do with the, the market in general going down, right? And people going to moving into Bitcoin as like the last resort type thing. Yeah. Um, well, I think that combined with the fact that FTX is not here to save shit coins, um, ultimately, because, you know, the, the whole bear market, we saw Bitcoin dominance either flat or down, like occasionally with these like spikes. But, you know, the, the whole bear market was Bitcoin dominance having problems. But as soon as FTX collapsed, you know, we, we saw the resurgence of, of Bitcoin dominance. Um, so I, I think that's that's probably the larger factor. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, but I mean, things haven't really gone down too much, right? Like, I mean, they've gone down some. We've been we've kind of been waiting for one direction or another to happen and, and nothing has really happened. Um, sorry for all the dirty lines here. Like, I know this chart looks quite dirty. Um, but I mean, we're still like, it's kind of like, okay, we hit the bottom things came up to the top. Everyone was optimistic that we could like, you know, come, come up to the upside and make 40, 50,000. Um, and right now things kind of broke down from this, this rising wedge, but despite breaking down from a rising wedge, like we haven't actually seen like a real hardcore breakdown, um, to the downside. So, um, we, we've got the, uh, this is the GPTC premium on the bottom currently at minus 16%. This thing is probably going to continue closing um, back to zero. 
I think the presumption is that um, BlackRock is going to get their ETF, which means that um, Grayscale is also probably going to get their ETF, um, which means that this thing will close to zero. Um, let's see. Uh, let's take a look real quick at um, the Monero divergences. So all week long, basically, uh, maybe not all week long, but for the last three days, looks like. Um, yeah, Monero prices have been um, divergently down on Binance, Polo, Finex, and Qcoin as related to Kraken, um, which is interesting because you know we actually saw um, we actually saw Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin, we saw Monero uh, moving to the upside versus Bitcoin um, right here. So uh, another thing to look at is um, this big head and shoulders that we've been talking about like for months now. Um, is uh right that green candle there is nice we actually broke through this very long term down sloping uh resistance line um i think this is very good sign this is exactly what we want to see right we've got the shoulder head and kind of a very large shoulder right here this sure. thing coming to the upside um if this continues like if we get another week like this i mean to me it's like the chart pattern is very clear and it's worth like it's worth a long it's worth a bet it's worth putting money into monero um as a as the chance that it could be correct uh, and again, you know, it's like it's tea leaves, it's probabilities, you know, it doesn't have to play out. But, um, but and, I mean, and te technically, if it did play out, where does that take you? Like, what, where would um, a chartist say that would take you to based on the head and shoulder? Uh, on the head and shoulder out. alone. So this line right here, what you do is you measure from the neckline to the head and then you just pull that over here. So that would put Monero at 1%, right about 1% dominance for the crypto market cap. Um, which also kind of lines up, if you'll notice, with the very long-term upper standard deviation bands, right? So, like this area right here is, is kind of where you would expect if um, if Monero pumped uh, along this this charting pattern, which would put it uh, about um, about three and a half to four x higher uh, oh, wow. than than its current price. Like all, everything else being equal, um, like if crypto just treaded water, stayed where it is. Um, and Monero pumped, that would put Monero, yeah, like three to four times um, higher in, in price, which would be currently 152. So yeah, that would be like $600. That would be sweet. <laughs> could, uh, could start using Travala. <laughs> I never sell my Monero. The only time I sell my Monero is when I need to make some kind of like crypto payment. And I'm like, no, you don't get to, you don't get to see my you know, my stable coin address or whatever. <laughs> Actually, I played a, a nice little um, chain analysis on, uh, I made a payment in stable coin and someone, they're like, here, send it to this address. So I looked it up on chain analysis or on uh, a block explorer, of course, and uh, exported the CSV. And I was like, oh, looks like you guys had X point X million dollars flow through that address in, in the last uh, uh, 90 days. <laughs> so like just in case you know you care about that kind of thing uh, was, i also have an response? error um you know they haven't responded to me yet I, it was like late maybe not late but like at the close of business yesterday so i don't think they've seen it yet but That's they'll funny. probably come back and be like no we're regulated and we can't so no like all right well if you ever want to do some freedom hit me up for monero i'll pay you guys a monero <laughs> Monero, Monero uh, transaction count is looking looking pretty solid. I just feel like yeah, it's, it's a slow looks, climb up. Looks like we've ticked up. Yeah, we're kind of above the twenty thousand mark, and we've been there since. Um, what would that be like? The beginning of the month, mm -hmm. mm, September twenty fifth, twenty fourth. Yeah, so we've kind of been above twenty thousand. Um, it's not like it's not massive, but we haven't had like this kind of um, consistent um, higher than twenty thousand transaction count for for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Let's go to, uh, yeah, really since, um, I guess since uh, May. What is this date for? Yeah, April, May. Yeah, I mean, it's optimistic. Especially given the bear market, right? It just feels like people are ignoring and, and actually using. There's, there's some some use base usage that's happening in Monero. I know I use it every day. <laughs> I mean, same. Even though it hurts, you know, a little more because we're in a bear market. Yeah. I still, I still use it because there's so much I can use it for, and I like yeah. using it. We, I mean, we run all our businesses with Monero, the people we pay and everything. And, and if I want to make up for the amount I'm spending now in the bear market for Monero, I can just buy more. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'll, I'll know. I'll look back and be like, wow, I ended, I, I spent quite a, quite a bit on that in retrospect, given what Monero's <laughs> worth today. But 
uh i don't know i've i've become numb to that just treat it like it's uh just you know try to live off of it comfortably numb <laughs> exactly so um there's maybe like one or two more things uh i would i would love to present to everyone yeah. today Go for it. um we're looking at here is the bitcoin cme price and on the bottom this is a correlation analysis um, it's a rolling three-week correlation analysis to the nasdaq the reason that we look at the cme bitcoin versus the nasdaq is that they're always open at the same time if you try and look at the bitcoin price relative to the nasdaq bitcoin has weekends and bitcoin never has weekends off and the nasdaq does so what i do is we look at this on the cme because the cme has the same hours basically um, at least maybe not the NASDAQ, but the NASDAQ futures, which is NQ1I, or sorry, NQ1 um, XCLAM. Anyways, okay, so the bottom here is a correlation analysis running three weeks. And you'll notice that for basically the whole bear market, um, there was heavy correlation. So zero is no correlation. One at the top here is positive correlation and minus one is negative correlation. So um, yeah, you'll notice that generally speaking for most of the bull market, we had positive correlation. Bitcoin had positive correlation to stocks, to the NASDAQ. And like for the entire bear market, it was like heavy correlation. And we kind of talked about this a little bit before where it's like stocks will go up and Bitcoin won't, crypto won't, stocks will go down and then somehow Bitcoin is doing well. You can see this right here on the bottom because you're oscillating around the zero point. What this means is no correlation, right? That's what this chart would suggest is that ever since about May, there has been, um, there's been no correlation between Bitcoin and stocks. They're like their daily movements basically, or their weekly movements. So um, I just thought that was, you know, it's, it's always good. We, we've talked about that before. We said, hey, there's, there seems to be like some very light anti-correlation um, sometimes. And so it's good to be able to put like a, a metric on that, a way to look at that and say, okay, let's, let's see how clear this, this correlation or anti-correlation or no correlation, right? Let, let, like how clear is that? So, um, yeah, I mean, kind of oscillating between correlated, not correlated, um, but I mean, crypto just hasn't moved very much, right? Like our range for the past um, two months is basically 13%. Um, maybe I did that measurement slightly wrong at yeah, 15%. So, um, yeah, there's that. And then um, the last thing we'll look at is um, Bitcoin relative to stocks. So um, just so we can like, you know, kind of tie that up there about how, um, how things look, how, how Bitcoin is performing relative to the stock market. So basically you just take Bitcoin, you divide it by the NASDAQ and, um, and, and you, you understand without looking at dollars, right? Without looking at fiat, you understand how they're performing relative to each other. So um, yeah, I mean, overall um, it's just kind of been sideways chop. Let's clear, clear the wave magic. That's not too important here. In fact, what we'll do is look at the weekly. We haven't looked at this chart in quite a while. Um, yeah. So Bitcoin obviously peaked quite high here in the bull market relative to NASDAQ. Um, this was the peak from 2017, and you'll notice that relative to stocks, since that peak in 2017, like Bitcoin is basically just performing about the same as stocks um, overall, right? With a lot of volatility, right? Significantly more volatility. Um, so I just thought that was uh, maybe useful to point out. Um, currently, so we're back here on the daily. Um, Currently, I mean, just kind of like chopping sideways, I, I would expect it to basically continue doing this. Maybe there's some light positive pressure here, um, or maybe you can break down this line. But overall, I, I would effectively expect to stay uh, inside this range. So um, it's, you know, that, that's probably not what the, uh, the moon boys want to hear, um, you know, because the moon boys say that, you know, Bitcoin is the thing to, to beat inflation. And it's like, well, eh, a lot of things beat inflation. All the finance bros have known for like, three decades that uh, that you got to beat inflation that you don't save in fiat. Um, and so it's the question is, well, which asset is going to go up today or tomorrow? Um, but, you know, I mean, uh, crypto is a reasonable play, right? Like um, it, the fundamental promise of a digital bearer asset is, is a big deal. Um, and no matter what, no, what any no coiner wants to say, it's a real thing. And it's minimally viable for that. Crypto as a whole is minimally viable for that. I mean, Monero is the best, um, censorship resistant digital bearer asset that exists um bitcoin is you know it's pretty good it's like minimally viable marginally viable um but i mean fundamentally it's a good play like buy it hold it use it you know save with it spend with it um and uh you know pray to the crypto gods <laughs> to pump our bags amen <laughs> nice 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 uh we do have red 132 asking about eth btc did you say, did you go over ETH BTC? Yeah. Uh, we kind of like slightly glanced over it. Yeah, so uh, we had this uh, descending wedge 
And um, it's kind of broken down that way. So I'm, I don't entirely trust that this breakdown is um, like, I, I don't necessarily think that the next move is down. We see um, sometimes we, we will often see breakdowns only to come back to the other side, which is kind of something we saw with the dollar index that we talked about earlier um, where like dollar or, or no, I'm sorry, um, gold. Let's go to gold. So just to show you an example of this really quick, gold had kind of this descending wedge, which it broke down and then immediately um, came back to the upside. So it's totally possible that this thing does something similar. Um, maybe we can pull the wave magic up. I, I wouldn't expect ETH to, to make any big breakouts right here. I don't, I don't see any reason for it to, for it to pump massively at the moment. Um, but I do think that in a bull market <clears throat> in the next, um, you know, the next very broad up movement of all markets, I think that, uh, ETH is very likely to to outperform Bitcoin yet again. There's just so much, <clears throat> excuse me. There's so much being developed on it. There's so much like useful stuff, useful tools. Um, and you know, the maximalists are probably kind of right that it's, you know, there's a lot of like bankers involved with ETH. There's a lot of like institutions involved with this thing. Um, it's useful for them. They can like the promise is there that they could develop stuff. I don't think that any of these institutions are really thinking about, um, really thinking about Bitcoin as like they're Turing complete um, platform that they can use to, you know, do all kinds of like crazy financial magic. One thing I would say here um, on the uh, the standard deviation bands, the lower standard deviation bands have now started to curl under. Um, it's they're kind of messy because you've got all of the, all of the short term bands overlaid with the long term bands, but even the long term bands, um, I don't know if you can see that very well. Make make sure to switch to 1080p. But even the long term bands are starting to move to the downside. This is like. From a wave magic standpoint, this is not good action. At best, you would hope that it would come back up here. Um, it needs to recover, like it. It definitely needs to recover here, um, or else, like I, I mean, from a wave again, speaking solely from the wave magic standpoint, you would say this thing needs to recover soon because these are curling under, and if price continues to languish down here, then you very, you very well could see a, a big uh, drop to the downside. Um, and again, maybe maybe this is because there's the promise of Turing completeness on Bitcoin now. Um, that's that's a possibility. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's uncertain. Like, I, I really I really don't know what to make of the markets right now. There's a lot of signals, kind of saying different things. The dollar index really pumped hard um, over the last month, uh, two months, and we didn't see stock markets drop by that much. Like, stocks were surprisingly resilient. Crypto has been surprisingly resilient, even in the face of some, um, even in the face of like some bad chart patterns. So, you know, I mean, and then we, and then we got the war going on. So now there's like even more reason to print. Um, I mean, the government shut down looms, which is, you know, the whole war was convenient for that as well. Right now they're, now they're probably going to figure out how to avert the terrible government shutdown um, that could, that was looming, um, which basically right. just means they're going to print more money. Right. But, All right, uh, buddy. Yeah. Uh, so today. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, did the Ring of Fire come through yet? Oh, I don't know. You know, I got to check it out. Like it should be. Yes. I mean, I'm not going to see the ring here. It's you know we're only 50 yeah, percent coverage, yeah. but uh, I think it's like right now. Like if you're in San Antonio or in Corpus Christi, Utah, it's it's probably happening like right now. So very cool, very cool. All right, I'm gonna go check that out. All right, buddy. Cheers. Thanks, buddy. Later. Thank you.